Hello, my name is Zach, and I'm with the Fun Robotics Network, and here with me today is Team 25751 Dread Pirate Robotics at the Alabama State Qualifier 3. Today, they're going to be talking about the rotor band intake, gravity feeder, and dual launcher. Let's learn more on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. So, Kevin, can you explain a little bit about your rubber band intake and how you've iterated on that throughout the season? So our rubber band intake here that intakes the artifacts on our robot, uh, our first iteration was literally a piece of cardboard with some rubber bands attached to a drill. And from there, we put it into CAD and we designed, we 3D printed it. And it's worked pretty well ever since. Uh, we've only broke it one time in competition. So how it works is we have this motor that's geared up one to one and then it spins the axle and it's uh, you drive up and you get an artifact to come in here and we just intake it. So I see you have a large steel shield, I'm guessing. Um, what was that for? So at their first qualifier, we did not have this. And when we were driving around, it got tangled up on a couple of robots and it broke one time. So that's on there for protection and it's also on there for defense. Because originally we were only able to play defense with one side of our robot. But with this, this gives us more uh, versatility to play defense with the other side of our robot. Absolutely, and talking about that steel, I see a lot of it on your robot. Can you talk about that design decision? Um, I'm sure that's a little bit more heavier. Okay, so last year we went to the first world championship uh, for Into the Deep, and we were a very light robot. We only had aluminum and 3D printed parts on our robot. We were getting pushed around like crazy because our robot was so light, and we wanted to be able to defend it so nothing broke. So this year we decided that we're gonna put steel plates around the robot. We also have these uh, polycarbonate sides that also protect our robot very well and it's been great. It, our robot is a little slower than most other robots but we make up for it in power. Have you found that disadvantage of speed to be um, too much or is it just that perfect amount? I feel like it's perfect amount. I'm one of the drivers and it's a perfect speed to come in and pick up artifacts especially rolling around the field. I feel I found that that's uh, it's a lot harder to do the ground intake especially this year um, but doing this with this speed is almost perfect. So moving on, Carolyn, can you talk a little bit about your um, gravity feed? Yeah, so we have inside of the robot, when it intakes it, it intakes up a little ramp. And then inside of it, it's completely gravity sorted. And so the tray is designed in CAD and then we 3D print it. And we actually first, before we did any of that, we made it out of Legos and kind of put balls in it, see how it worked. And then after that, after kind of the first cup, when we were having dead spots in it, um, we went back and we used modeling clay to kind of shape different areas of it. And so that's kind of how we got to this now. But basically it comes up and it has a kind of ramp in the middle and it just splits off to either left or right side. And it can hold three. And once one moves, uh, the third one kind of just falls back into place. So that's kind of how it basically works. So I know, I, I heard you mention modeling clay. I know that usually takes quite a while to dry. Uh, how is that experience with y'all and just making sure everything was molded correctly and testing it quickly? So we used the heat gun to dry our clay. And in the process, the inside did melt a little bit, but it made it so that we kind of, we modeled it and then we immediately uh, used the heat gun to dry it. So it was kind of right after we modeled it to kind of keep the shape. Awesome, yeah, and uh, moving on to your launcher, uh, Gavin or Caroline, could you explain um, a little bit about why the dual launcher? So uh, our dual launcher, when we sat down and we all uh, came up with concepts at the beginning of the season, uh, we designed multiple different concepts and we landed on the dual um, with the option of potentially shifting to a three launcher robot. Uh, we found that two is like a happy median between uh, being able to shoot multiple at a time, but also being consistent. We found that our robot is really consistent, especially during teleop when it comes to shooting uh, balls into the uh, the depot. Um, 
Yeah, do you have anything else? Yeah, and uh, moving on from that, I see that you only have one motor. Have you found any downsides of uh, kind of that speed drop with two launches on only one motor? All right, so at the beginning, uh, when we first, we just hit, hooked up the motor one to one, and that was draining our battery fast, and it was very hard to speed all the way back up. So we got a faster motor, and we geared it up so that it also it's faster, but it also gets back up to speed faster. Uh, we found that uh, during our auto, we have a function, so we're at the end, it'll shoot both in case one gets stuck in our uh, in our cage, but that has happened very rarely. Um, but yeah. Uh, in the launcher too, we added flywheels to kind of help with the motor efficiency and not have as much battery drainage. So we do have weights in the middle of each uh, flywheel to help with that as well. And so I see these like slots on the outside of your hood. What are those used for? Um, so those are, uh, it makes it adjustable, so it's not necessarily adjustable in game, but out of game, we can experiment with different angles, mostly. And then, like, if we ever need to adjust it, we have that capability. Absolutely. And uh, one unique thing I've seen on the robot is your wheels are kind of reversed from what you normally see. They're kind of perpendicular from that normal parallel. Um, why with that decision? So we originally picked this design with our mechanism drive because we were out of space doing it any other way. And additionally, this kind of also added a capability to be able to put our odometry pods in as well and defend it with uh, steel. Um, another addition because of this originally was because if a ball artifact hits on either side of the um, wheels, additionally, it kind of helps guide it towards the middle. And I heard you say odometry pods. Is that the go build a pinpoint computer? Um, and have you experimented with any other devices that um, you kind of learned and uh, evolved from those systems from the past? Yes, so these are the GoBuild Up Pinpoint. And originally we used SparkFun's odometry um, sensor, but we shifted towards more of the pods just because we found it to be a little more reliable. Um, additionally, we don't use anything such as Roadrunner or Pedro Pathing. We hand coded all of our autonomous code and all of our odometry code um, from clearly from scratch. That's really amazing. So could you explain a little bit of, uh, more in depth on that uh, custom autonomous pathing? Yeah. So. What, how we start with our autonomous is we just go into teleop with our um, dometry telemetry and we kind of just push around the robot where we want it to be and we plug all those values into autonomous and then we kind we just see how that works and we have a PID of course implemented that helps with speed and overshooting and that's uh, us making our own uh, dometry code really helped us understand how it works and if there's any errors or anything we can easily fix it because now we understand how fully how it works. Absolutely, and uh, you talked about kind of ensuring the uh, timing is correct, the PIDs. Could you kind of give us a small demonstration of um, your intake to flipping system? Yes, so. Yes, so we re Gavin, I know spoke about this a little bit, but we what we do is we turn on the cage and then once. Now. So once we have the cage on, we have these two flippers, one on each side, so that help that flip up and control which um, artifacts we want to launch. Additionally, if we have um, three artifacts inside of our robot, our cage automatically turns off, allowing making sure we don't control more than three in game. This has really, really helped us with our reliability and efficiency. Additionally, both these um, two um, um, flippers, at the, uh, each of our launch cycles in autonomous, it runs, we have three color sensors inside of our robot, and each one of them flip until there's detected no artifacts left. And I've seen uh, on a few other robots, especially like spin detectors, they had a lot of designs when it came to those flippers. Have you all uh, made a few iterations on those, and how did you come to the ones you had today? So, um, Gavin, would you like to talk about this? Let's talk about this. So, um, we originally started with just a just a ball on a stick flipper, and we found that it kept getting stuck in the side of the inside of the artifact. Uh, we went through multiple different iterations before we finally came to ours, about six or seven. Um, we finally landed on this one. This one has been really consistent for us so far. Uh, we are planning on redesigning our flippers a little more uh, before state, making them a little bit longer so they're more consistent when it comes to auto. We found that sometimes during auto, the flipper doesn't go up all the way, so the ball doesn't ever make it to the flywheel. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Red Pirates. You have so many innovative, unique things in your robot from that dual launcher, the gravity feed, your urban intake, and your nearly all steel robot. There's so many unique, cool things that we can learn from it. I hope to see everyone again on Behind the Bot. This is Zach signing off. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Animark is your one stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high quality and affordable solutions. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands on co op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu first.